right, so being the NASA speaker after that is ne not necessarily the best place to be, I guess. All of the darts were thrown at us, and, and now I have to explain why we can't do exactly why, what uh, Dr. Zubrin uh, pointed out. Um, I'm not going to try to address that directly. Um, I hope to get lots of questions. I hope to rip through this fairly quickly so you guys can ask those tough questions of, uh, you know, specifically uh, elements that NASA is not doing that we possibly could be doing uh, in, instead of uh, what our current plan is. The bottom line, of course, of, uh, of that is that uh, NASA is, is controlled by politics. It's administrations that set policy on uh, what we uh, want to do with the uh, space program uh, is controlled, of course, by the administration and by Congress. And, uh, you know, the battles between them have an awful lot to do with uh, what direction we get to go and uh, what we get to invest in. There is no doubt that there are many Mars enthusiasts in the agency today people that want to go to Mars as quickly as possible, people that are very sick of having to constantly uh, do more and more studies about technologies, about uh, vehicles, about um, capabilities in order to go to Mars, uh, and would rather um, just get on with it. Um, that, that hasn't been easy. There are also competing demands within the agency, of course. Uh, there are demands um, to do science missions uh, that compete with uh, demands to do uh, uh, human exploration missions uh, and demands to do uh, aeronautics work, um, which is actually a very small part of the overall NASA budget, but it does exist. And, uh, you know, there's also demands uh, to maintain the space station. It has international partnerships. Uh, you know, it has its own fans. We should just continue to uh, extend the life of space station. Well, the space station program, the support for that program, to just give an example of, of the politics that, is, that are inherent within the agency, is a $3 billion a year program out of uh, our current budget, which uh, can be somewhere between 16 and $17 billion, depending on uh, which uh, branch of Congress or the administration you currently ask uh, at our future budgets because of sequestration and everything it's likely that our total budget will actually go down. It still is 16 billion or more uh, uh, a year, which is substantial, but there are lots of pieces of that that are, that are carved out and set aside and said, hey, that money has to go towards space station or that money has to go towards the science uh, endeavors uh, of the agency. And so it's, you have to look at what's left and say, can you carve out what is necessary in order to do a Mars mission, or for that matter, any mission beyond low Earth orbit uh, with humans uh, with what's left. And that is, even th that that is left is highly politicized. Um, so we would love to get on with it, believe me. Um, so I, I'm, I'm gonna give a, a, a few minutes about what space technology is. Space technology uh, within NASA is a new mission directorate. Uh, there are four mission directorates within NASA. Uh, there's the aeronautics mission directorates, there's the science mission directorate, uh, there's the human exploration and operations mission directorate uh, that develops the capabilities like SLS and, and, and Orion, uh, as well as uh, uh, covering the space station. Uh, and then there's the space technology mission directorate. So there's the four mission directorates. All of the programmatic funding goes through one of those four mission directorates. Um, roughly speaking, uh, the budget breaks down that there's about nine billion, eight to nine billion dollars that is spent in human exploration and operations. There's about five billion that's spent on station, uh, on on science, on the science mission directorate. Uh, there is the operational upkeep of the ten NASA centers that takes up uh, the balance. Uh, and then if you if you look at the two smaller mission directorates, aeronautics mission directorate and the space technology mission directorate, each is around $600 million. So those two small mission directorates don't take up the big chunk of the budget, but for with the piece that we're talking about today, which is a space technology mission directorate, what we are trying to do is get things done so that we can, in fact, enable missions in the future. Um, and we want to deliver innovative solutions. Uh, we don't want to essentially use 
the existing capabilities and technologies without any development. Even uh, the items that um, Dr. Zubrin brought up this morning require development. Uh, you know, he was very careful with his words, and he says that these are technologies that we can develop. In other words, it isn't radical new technologies that are outside of the realm of, of, of possibility. We can go develop them, we know exactly how to develop them, and we can go and prove that they work, and then uh, develop the mission capabilities to go along with them so that, in fact, we can use them. Um, and, and a lot of what we d we're doing within the Space Technology Mission Directorate is, in fact, focused on those near-term technologies that are needed for exploration. Um, however, we also will look at longer-term technologies that are needed for missions much further out, but those technology investments are very small relative to uh, the larger ex uh, investments that are needed for the near-term activities. We're also trying to make sure that we do investments where we make missions more affordable. Um, you know, you, the argument was made that we can in fact do it with two heavy lift launches uh, using the Mars Direct strategy. Well, depending on which uh, architectural approach you use, uh, how reliable you want the systems to be, um, how much redundancy, uh, how much capability you want on Mars surface, uh, that estimate uh, goes anywhere from uh, uh, nine SLS launches, heavy lift launches, down to two. There's a wide range of them, depending on which architecture uh, analyst you talk to and what they think is actually required to perform the mission. One thing is for sure, though. If you use certain technologies, you could drive down that mass significantly. To get down to the two that was discussed earlier, there's a lot of key things that you need to include. You need to include uh, surface fission power. You need to include ISRU in order to develop your ascent propellants. You need to have uh, an EDL capability to get through the thin Martian atmosphere. These are absolute requirements and they are needed in order to not just uh, to be able to realize a, a a realistic mission, but they're needed in order to drive down the mass to the point where you could actually have a realizable mission. Because nobody thinks that we're going to do a single mission to Mars, send people there and bring people back with nine heavy lift launches per mission. Uh, the, the budgets and the realities of trying to do that are unrealistic. Everybody recognizes that. We're going to have to do it with a, a smaller construct. Uh, such as a couple of SLS launches. So affordability is driven by including technologies that in fact drive that, those, those mass to low Earth orbit down, uh, at least from a Mars perspective. Um, the Space Technology Mission Directorate is all, also about creating new marketplaces. There is um, a lot of work going on, for example, in the suborbital reusable uh, commercial uh, launch vehicle space. Um, this isn't necessarily uh, a great utility for Mars, otherwise, other, although some of the work on a potential Mars ascent vehicle uh, might come out of that, um, uh, those efforts. But it is important in order to have an aerospace industry that has broad breadth to it. In other words, it isn't just uh, a few people working on, a f on one particular mission to go to Mars. You really have to have a sustainable base to the to the overall aerospace program. And part of that sustainable base is to have marketplaces such as the suborbital commercial market. Um, and we're also about trying to bring the next generation of people uh, within the agency and in the aerospace community uh, as a whole uh, forward. Um, you know, I've been around NASA and the aerospace uh, industry for a couple of decades myself at this point. Uh, and I'm recognizing that we haven't moved that far, that much further ahead towards actually putting people on the surface of Mars today relative to when I started and I had that first uh, idea that that's what we should be doing at NASA. Um, and, uh, you know, it may be another um, decade, it may be a lot longer than that before we actually get humans to Mars, uh, depending on, on the will of our stakeholders to actually move the ball forward and the will of the agency to say, yes, we're going to go and do this. 
Um, but one thing I will say is it's absolutely essential that they, there are young people within the agency and in the aerospace community to, to pick up this, this mantle and move it forward um, with or without us. Even if we don't get it done, they have to be around. If we do succeed in achieving Mars surface in, let's say, a decade, uh, which I think is still fairly highly optimistic, but if we were to do that, um, mission, we don't want to just uh, be the engineers and the graybeards that do it. We want a whole generation of younger folks to actually be part of that effort so that they could carry the, the baton even further forward and extend uh, human presence beyond, beyond even uh, Mars. Uh, so let me talk a little bit uh, about uh, the challenge <coughs> challenges for deep space exploration. In short, these have not changed in a couple of decades. Uh, we still have communications challenges. We still have uh, navigation improvement challenges. Uh, you know, there was a lot of talk earlier about the radiation challenges. Um, you know, the, the, there's constant debate about those. Uh, so those are all, in, in my view, maybe the softer challenges. Um, but then, you know, th we do have to settle in on an architecture. What kind of propulsion system are we really going to use to get to Mars and return from Mars? Um, and there are a lot of branches in that trade space still, and there are options that have very different uh, ramifications in terms of cost and affordability and um, uh, executability, how, more, how robust that mission really turns out to be. Uh, EDL at Mars is still a huge challenge. Um, if you want to put something down that is a significant size, more than MSL size, uh, uh, those challenges are still out there. Logistics on Mars, you know, when you're going to get there, when you get there, what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, um, and all of the supplies that you have to have uh, with you, uh, that remains uh, a, a challenge. So, the, you know, in short, these, these things have not changed in the last couple of decades. They're the same challenges that we've had for a while, which means that we haven't made enough progress in these areas with the technology programs that we have had in place today. So what are the new emerging trends in, in space technology? Uh, well, I talked a little bit about um, the commercial space. Part of the commercial uh, suborbital space, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of in family, is the move towards small spacecraft. There's a big move towards doing things with small spacecraft, at least for Earth science applications and for robotic missions to in, in planetary settings as well. Uh, the, of course, the enormous advantage of using small spacecrafts is that uh, it's a lot less mass up, and then you could get a lot, you could hopefully get as much done with a lot less mass, which makes it much more affordable to do that. There's also swarm technology where you group many of these smaller satellites together in order to get uh, a particular accomplishment done. So that is an emerging area that uh, we're working on. Uh, there is a transform transformative uh, uh, effort going on in the EDL uh, area that I will get to a little later that is really changing how we're really thinking about the future of how to get things to Mars. Um, propulsion, there's a lot going on in, in the propulsion area and I will highlight those things. Uh, and in fact, we are working right now on improving COM. There's a transition going on in the communications area, at least for planetary missions. Uh, to move from uh, RF-based communications to laser-based communications uh, to be able to significantly up the bandwidth of communications uh, uh, and at the same time reduce the power and mass requirements. Uh, you know, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, of course, is making huge inroads uh, into terrestrial applications. And in fact, um, there's work now going on to build uh, or print things like rocket engines uh, with these technologies that, that will, in fact, have an impact on the affordability of those systems. And of course, as, as uh, Dr. Zubrin uh, talked about earlier, there's big changes in robotics and what we learned we can do with robotics in space. So how does the Space Technology Mission Directorate go about its business? We do this using these principles. We're a bit different than uh, previous uh, incarnations of NASA's technology programs. Uh, if any of you have followed NASA's budget for uh, the last couple of decades, you will 
you will quickly realize that um, technology investments within NASA are very fickle. They, they, they go through up and down trends. Entire programs are completely uh, eliminated and for a time period NASA doesn't uh, have a significant technology investment program. And at other times, uh, it, uh, they're robust. Um, and then they switch between focused on only near-term technologies that are needed for the next mission to only doing far-out technologies that are needed maybe 30 or 40 years out. In other words, go work on warp drive, even though we won't be thinking about using that for another 30 years or more. Um, and so that, that philosophical uh, swinging back and forth, as well as the budget uh, oscillations in the technology program has, has rendered a, a situation within NASA where we have not a sustainable, credible uh, capability to, to on-ramp technologies, get those technologies done, and move them out into the mission space uh, for future missions. So what we have tried to do is, is follow a little bit of the SMD science mission directorate lead here, where they have decadal surveys. They don't say NASA is going to develop their own science missions to go do. They, they pull in academia, they pull in uh, external stakeholders, they, they pull in other government agencies, uh, they pull in the public, and together uh, that group, uh, chaired by the Nas National Resor Research Council, goes and looks at what missions are appropriate for the various divisions within the science mission directorate to go do, and they publish these through dec decadal surveys. These are peer-reviewed, uh, publicly uh, uh, vetted uh, uh, priorities for the science missions of NASA's future. We've done the same thing with technology. We have and uh, we put together technology roadmaps, uh, and we have uh, hired the NRC to come in and evaluate and prioritize NASA's technology investments. Um, and now that has been tried before within w the previous space technology programs, but they never actually got it done. We actually have completed it. We have a report, it tells you exactly what NASA's technology priorities are, and it was vetted uh, by other government agencies, uh, academia, industry, and the public. We had public forums on, on, on developing the inputs to that process. So we try to use the top cover, the, our strategic plan, by actually looking out at industry and academia and the overall aerospace community to help us decide what our priorities are as opposed to just saying NASA is going to choose what it wants to do and play in its own sandbox about technologies. That's often a criticism of previous technology programs. Uh, so we invest in a, a portfolio and by that I mean across the spectrum of both low TRL and high TRL activities and that just means that we're working on really near-term stuff Sometimes that near-term stuff is expensive to demonstrate, uh, but we're also uh, working with universities and doing grants at the very low TRL work uh, and doing things like fellowships where we're funding uh, students uh, to get involved in technology development. Uh, we're also using, looking at both cross-cutting technologies and transformative technologies, and by that I mean uh, there are certain technologies that that technology is maybe only really applicable to a, one particular mission, such as maybe uh, the Mars ISRU is really only applicable to a human mission to Mars. Uh, a science mission to Mars probably isn't really looking towards uh, needing that uh, kind of capability, as an example, or, or life support or radiation protection. Um, and so we're looking at transformative technologies in those areas while also looking at cross-cutting technologies where a particular technology is useful for multiple applications. Uh, I give the example of solar electric propulsion where electric propulsion is being looked at as a potential propulsion capability for deep space human exploration, but the DOD has strong interest in it. The commercial uh, satellite uh, communications world has strong interest in it, and so we look at that as a cross-cutting technology investment. Uh, we, we also are doing this based off of merit-based competition, which means that we compete uh, uh, the technology development efforts uh, to the largest extent possible. Previous N NASA technology programs have been, have been faulted for essentially uh, pouring money into NASA centers to do open-ended research as opposed to uh, competing the technology so you get the best technology ideas and the best people to work on them and not necessarily uh, 
uh, people at NASA centers that are, have been used to having a sustained level of uh, investment so they could go do their research. Uh, so we're st trying to step away that with that from that with the competition based uh, competition based approach. Uh, we also execute all of our projects as real projects. They have very clear milestones. They have start dates and end dates. They have a, f a fixed budget and we manage it to those levels. It isn't just turn on the spigot, give them money and let them work on it indefinitely. Um, and so that's a very different approach than some of the previous technology programs. And our idea is to infuse uh, um, uh, fast or, or, or fail fast. So either you get it done and you, you use that technology in a future mission or you decide that that technology isn't worth the investment or they're not meeting their milestones and you, and you terminate the project. Um, that's the approach. So we have nine technology programs within the Space Technology Mission Directorate. The top three are all focused on um, more near-term work or actual technology advancement. This is where significant amount of the dollars of the space technology program go. Uh, the game-changing uh, development program is where we do ground testing and prototyping of specific technologies. Uh, in the technology demonstrations missions program, that's where we actually do an in-space demonstration of a particular technology. Uh, and those can range, those in-space demonstrations can range from you know, order tens of millions to order hundreds of millions, depending on the complexity and, and, the, and the challenge of the demonstration. Usually a lot of that has to do with just the upmass. In other words, being able to launch a tech demo still requires us to go find a launch uh, candidate to be able to uh, push us up there, and that usually costs money. Uh, you know, the, the problems with uh, access to space are still uh, fairly profound. The cost of access to space uh, still uh, is, you know, on the order of tens of thousands of dollars a pound. Uh, and, you know, as long as that's the case, uh, space technology demonstrations are going to still be expensive, even if the demo itself isn't that uh, um, elaborate. Uh, the small spacecraft uh, technology program, I talked a little bit about that earlier. We are investing, we have a program dedicated towards that. Um, uh, they met this week out at the small spacecraft uh, conference uh, out in Logan, Utah. If any of you guys uh, have, haven't participated in that, I, I highly encourage you to do that. It's a great aerospace community uh, that is rallying around the idea of small spacecraft. And in fact, I view it as having a lot of synergy about those, with those folks that are interested in going uh, to, to Mars surface with people. Um, the, the second swim lane uh, is really talking about our lower TRL ex ex uh, investments. These are for uh, research, uh, the technology, uh, space technology research grants is where our fellowships, student fellowships, we have roughly about 200 students that are in the program right now getting their masters and PhD degree, D degrees while they're investing or developing technologies under mentorship uh, with uh, NASA individuals. Uh, the, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts uh, program is really looking at concept studies, you know, very low, one to three TRL, where they're looking at new concepts uh, for the future. Uh, and then the Center Innovation Fund is really a grassroots uh, activity that is really uh, uh, focused for at the 10 NASA centers to say what is coming up uh, in terms of innovation. Can we change the NASA culture at those centers to become more innovative in their thinking so that there is a a greater pull of technology and innovation into the space agency uh, and into the aerospace sector. Um, you know, we see this going on in uh, a lot of other sectors. It needs to happen at NASA. It needs to happen in the aerospace sector. Uh, the cent Centennial Challenge, the last swim lane is really about different uh, models for business development. The Centennial Challenges uses prize authority uh, within NASA to uh, develop technologies uh, as opposed to writing contracts or grants. Uh, so there's been many cases where we've actually put out a prize for something like an astronaut glove and, and gotten uh, somebody to win that and prove that you could build a better astronaut uh, 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 glove for uh, EVA applications uh, than uh, NASA had uh, as their baseline design. Um, the Small Business uh, in Innovation and in, uh, Research uh, Program, STT, SBIR, STTR, um, that is any technology, any agent government 
federal government agency that has a technology or an R&D element has to have an SBIR program. Uh, it sits within the Space Technology Mission Directorate, uh, and it d really uh, uh, is looking towards getting small businesses involved in uh, technology development. And then flight opportunities is what I talked about a little earlier, where we're looking at opening up the marketplace for uh, suborbital commercial reusable spacecraft to do both technology and science demonstrations uh, as a uh, more affordable stepping stone to doing those things uh, in, in uh, uh, orbit or in space applications. Uh, if you look at the space technology program, these are our biggest uh, technology investments. They represent a significant part of our budget. Uh, uh, each of these, I'm not going to go into them in detail here. Um, but I just wanted to put this out there so everybody knows uh, if you want to ever see what the leading investments that we're making with, it, with, with our uh, limited budget in the space technology world, uh, uh, these are, are them. Uh, we expect to do lots of demonstrations over the next few years, uh, including things like solar sails, uh, including things uh, like um, solar electric propulsion and cryogenic propellant storage and transfer. Uh, I'm not going to go through these uh, because I know you guys are all interested in us getting forward and thinking about, well, what are we doing specifically for Mars um, uh, and sending humans to Mars surface. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. This is my viewpoint of the challenges to get to Mars uh, surface. Uh, we've got to have surface power. We have to improve our current life support uh, capability. If you take the ECLIS system, this is... Um, uh, the life support system on space station today. Uh, you know, the water loop is about 70 percent and the uh, air loop is about 42 percent. That's in the most ideal setting. Uh, and that's compared to fully closing the loop and not having uh, consumables in those two areas. Um, closing those loops are very challenging and we're working on that. But more importantly, those, those systems are not reliable enough to go for a multi-year mission um, uh, or even a year mission to Mars. Uh, they, they break down way too easily. They're too fragile. They cannot be used uh, in a current Mars application. Uh, we need something much more reliable. We're working both on the reliability as well as loop closure uh, in life support. Uh, human uh, op support and robotics, um, you know, there's an awful lot that can be done by robots working with people. Uh, it doesn't have to just be all robotics, and it doesn't have to be all people. It's the combination of those that we think are, have the future and will offload a lot of the things that need to be done um, uh, to, for a human mission uh, to Mars. Um, so space radiation, we had a great conversation about that this morning. Uh, I tend to agree that if you really want to get uh, down to uh, trying to stop uh, uh, galactic particles uh, because you're afraid that that's going to give a, a cancer risk uh, to uh, the astronauts uh, over um, you know a year or two years or three years on a Mars mission um, you're probably looking at reducing the wrong kind of risk while you are increasing those cancer risks you know anybody that jumps onto a rocket and says we're going to go to Mars, and I don't care if it's a NASA built rocket or and or it's 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 built by you know, SpaceX or it's built by uh, some other entity or group that comes together and does it. The whole enterprise is going to be highly risky. The chances of having some critical path uh, failure occur are going to be high. You know, anytime you launch spacecraft, there's always a risk that you're going to have a failure. Anytime you uh, have, we talked about the ECLIS system, uh, you know, that has a chance of failure. Uh, getting down to Mars surface, the EDL, anybody that watched uh, MSL go down and, and, and saw the description of the seven minutes of terror uh, recognize how challenging that can be, it's going to be more challenging on a human mission. Uh, the Mars ascent vehicle and the surface systems, the ISRU systems, they all have to work in order for you to get off the planet if that is your goal. Uh, uh, and then, of course, you've got to get back from Mars uh, all the way back to Earth, and then you have to perform the entry back into Earth's atmosphere probably at much higher speeds than anything we've done to date. 
Uh, all of those are, high, are in, inject risk, and they multiply out. So, you know, you have a 1% chance of a launch failure. You have a 1% chance of a uh, Earth departure failure. You have a 1% chance that the Eclipse isn't gonna, is going to stop working on the way to Mars. Uh, you have a 1% chance that you're going to fail getting down to the surface. Maybe your ISU isn't going to work. You multiply all these out and you suddenly realize that that failure of actually surviving that mission is actually much more of, of a concern than cancer risk uh, from galactic particles. So I kind of share that view that we shouldn't necessarily be uh, freaking out about the radiation risks and we should be uh, attendant to them though. And by that I mean we should be fully aware of what those risks are and we should be monitoring uh, the solar particle hazards because they can kill you if you have a solar flare and you're in an, unex uh, in an exposed area. Uh, they could be very hazardous, they could kill you. It's not just, you know, cancer, it's, they could kill you. So you have to be monitoring space weather, uh, what the sun's activities are, and you have to be able to have storm shelters in effect to be able to shield yourself from uh, those activities. You need to have dosimeters so the astronauts know what the dosages are that they're, that, that they're taking with them. All of these things need to be done. Um, so, okay, I'm getting a 10 minute warning, so I'm going to accelerate here. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, these, but I, I, I'm providing this so that anybody could go and look at them later. These are the actual technology investments that STMD is making in those eight areas. Uh, these are, do the, the dots represent Specific, te well, the rows represent specific technology investments. Uh, the columns on the top are components or capabilities that we think we need in order to get to Mars surface, uh, uh, specific components of that. Uh, and then the dots represent where those technologies are actually applicable. So we, we go through this mapping to determine, uh, you know, what's the importance of a particular technology investment. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the asteroid mission. Uh, I'm going to touch on it very briefly, um, and uh, that the and I'm talking about the new asteroid mission that has been brought up. Uh, the key that I wanted to get at here is that even if we go to cis lunar space uh, to an asteroid, we're actually getting a lot of things done uh, uh, in terms of gaining experience with SLS and Orion so that we could go further with those capabilities. Um, the way that I like to think about the asteroid mission is that uh, SLS and Orion are going to come online in the 2020 to 2025 time period. That's the time period that we're going to go operational with those systems. When we go operational with those systems, we have to have at least a first place to go to test those capabilities before we go on, let's say, to Mars surface uh, with those capabilities. So if that's where, uh, if, if we need to have a test place and we don't have other components such as lunar landers or uh, things that might go to other destinations, uh, at, you know, uh, long uh, propulsion so that we could go and do a round trip to an asteroid mission, for example, we need some uh, location in order to test our capabilities. If we bring the rock back to the cis lunar space, our thought is that is a very affordable place, a affordable way to test those near-term capabilities so that we could get on with the business of getting way beyond uh, cis lunar space. And so I'm just marking off some areas that we in fact are getting done um, with the asteroid and then you could see that as we go further, uh, longer stay in deep space, we'll take care of more of these capabilities. Uh, and eventually we get to um, humans to Mars surface uh, and you could see this list is essentially the list of technologies that we think we need to develop. These are doable technologies. They're not far out that can't be done. These are things that we know we can do. We just have to get on with the business of actually developing them. Um, I'll skip the asteroid mission uh, concept uh, discussion. Uh, if you guys have questions on it, uh, you could, you could uh, follow up. The key thing I wanted to get at here is the Space Technology Mission Directorate side of it is we're agnostic. We don't care really what the Human Exploration Mission Directorate or the Science Mission Directorate say they want to do as far as their next missions. We're, we're 
Our job is to make sure that we get the technologies demonstrated to support their capabilities. So if they say they want to do this uh, asteroid retrieval, asteroid redirect mission, then we're going to say, okay, well, we're going to develop the solar electric propulsion capability to enable that. It turns out that the, you cannot do the asteroid redirect mission without solar electric propulsion. If you were to try to do it chemically, it would take two to three SLS launches just to do that mission. So chemically trying to do it isn't going to work, so you're forced to say, okay, let's use solar electric propulsion. If you do it with solar electric propulsion, you could do that redirect mission on an Atlas uh, 551, which is a much smaller launch vehicle, and you only need one of them. So it makes a huge difference, and we ho hope to use solar electric propulsion in the future. Uh, so there are many applications uh, to solar electric propulsion. Of course, this crowd of co is interested in the deep space human exploration. The way that uh, you would use solar electric propulsion for a human exploration mission is imagine that you have two or three launches in order to do a Mars surface mission. One of those launches would probably occur a couple years earlier and would be about placing things like the habitat and the ISRU and the surface power system on Mars and also staging your Earth return uh, um, propulsion system so that when you finally send the crew, the crew goes off, has all of their consumables and life support equipment uh, to, and, and, and the lander to get to the surface. Uh, they go all the way there. When they get there, the Earth Ascent, uh, the Mars Ascent vehicle, the ISRU system, uh, uh, and the surface power are all in place already because they were staged there early. And they were staged there early using SEP um, because SEP will cut the amount of mass it, you need in low Earth orbit to send all of that equipment to Mars uh, by a half or more. So I'm really running out of time here. Um, I'm going to skip this. So here are just some technology specifics that we're working on. We're working on cryogenic, um, composite cryogenic propellant tanks. This we hope to use for the upper stage of SLS and for things like the Earth departure stage and the Mars uh, departure stage. Um, if we actually switch from the aluminum lithium technology that we build all of our launch vehicles today out of, uh, things like the upper stage tanks and the inner tank stages and all of the components, uh, we will uh, shave 30% off of the mass of the upper stage. 30% shavings off of the mass of the upper stage directly change turns into payload. So if you did this, you essentially increase the payload capability of uh, the SLS by 30% just by replacing the, all of the components of the upper stage with composites. Same thing gear ratio wise happens uh, and is a big factor if you think about your Earth departure stage, maybe that's the same as your uh, upper stage or your Mars um, return stage. Uh, Doing those with composites will significantly reduce the amount of mass that we need to do it. And this is now feasible. This is doable. We are built a two and a half meter uh, a composite tank, cryogenic tank, that could store liquid hydrogen. It has been tested to pressure and temperature multiple cycles very successfully. We are building and have recently completed the 5.5 meter tank, which is the same size um, as uh, everything but, you know, something like SLS, but is, it is the size for the upper stage uh, uh, for SLS. And that, uh, that tank at 5.5 at meters will also be tested uh, with uh, liquid hydrogen. It is the, you know, the, the crux of that problem. Once you've solved that, then you have to integrate the rest into an upper stage article that you could go ahead and say, we could on-ramp onto uh, SLS and make a big savings. We're doing uh, CPST, cryogenic propellant storage and transfer. Uh, if you want to get away from um, uh, soft cryogens, and that, by that I mean oxygen and, and uh, methane, and you want to move to higher performance uh, cryogens such as uh, oxygen and hydrogen, you make a big difference in doing that, and the technology is feasible to do cryogenic propellant storage and transfer. All we need is to complete this demonstration in space uh, once we've done that, I think everybody will uh, jump on board and say, we've got the blanket technology and the cryocooler technology today to be able to do near zero boil off of liquid hydrogen uh, in space, which would 
significantly change the amount of mass we need to do a Mars human mission. Uh, we're also working on EDL missions, um, uh, EDL kit technologies. Uh, the current limit uh, for the entry vehicle is limited by the shroud size of things like SLS. Uh, you know, the, for, for the MSL and its follow-on, that's limited to five meters because that's the, the fairing size of the Atlas 551 that's used uh, to launch those uh, capabilities. If you want to go and you say, well, we could use SLS, that might get you up to maybe eight meter diameter uh, fairing. Um, and so you might be able to do an eight meter diameter rigid aero shell. Well, that still isn't big enough for most human mission uh, designs to Mars. Uh, and so the, the upshot here is that we're looking at deployable technologies, which is emerging capability that could, that could, we could ramp up to 20 or even 30 meter diameter heat shields that could allow you to put a very large payloads to the Mars surface. Um, we are also working on the D part of that EDL. The D part is the descent part. The descent part looks at parachutes uh, and things like inflatables, uh, decelerators. It turns out that Mars's thin atmosphere is very difficult for uh, anybody to use. It's too thin uh, to really have a very efficient braking system using the atmosphere as your brake, but it is too thick to just go all uh, retro rocket like you do with a lunar lander. Um, and so you have to develop these capabilities. We don't have the technology today that we've demonstrated to be able to do the descent part of uh, the mission um, uh, for anything over one metric ton. Well, every th design that's out there uh, that you look at w is for a Mars human mission is, m is much more than a metric ton to the surface. Uh, it's, you know, you can maybe get down to 10 metric tons or so for some of the systems to the surface, but that requi still requires a descent system, a set of parachutes or a set of uh, inflatable decelerators that we do not have and that now we are testing those. Uh, and then, so, I'm, I'm just about done. <laughs> so, we are also working on ISRU. Uh, as discussed earlier, we, are, we do intend to put an ISRU demo on Mars 2020. Um, you know, we have to do this in partnership with the Science Mission Directorate. Uh, they have many other instruments and science instruments that they want to put onto that rover. And so, we're only going to get a limited amount of payload uh, and space to be able to do an ISRU demo. And the piece that we intend to do is um, the CO2 extraction and purification out of the Mars atmosphere because that's the piece that's going to be difficult to prove out that you can do. Um, so we're, we're going to do that piece. That means dust removal, other constituent removal. That means stability over temperature and uh, pressure conditions at Mars. And we're going to put that on the 2020 rover. Um, that will lead to an eventual complete Mars ISRU capability to, to convert CO2 to oxygen, and that will be your main oxidizer, not just for people, but for the ascent propellant system. And if you look at those bars over there, you could see that O2 is, is a huge chunk of the overall mass of that ascent system. Uh, it's actually much more than the, the, the propellant, uh, other propellants such as methane or or uh, hydrogen, depending on uh, what you end up with, just because the uh, oxygen uh, turns out to be the heavy piece of this. So if you get rid of the oxygen, then you get rid of uh, having to take it to the surface, and that makes a big difference. So we're working on that today, and we do plan on doing the technology demonstrations that are necessary, such that that capability is available when we're ready to go to Mars. And um, that wraps it up. Um, of course, you know, there's a lot of people involved in the Space Technology Mission Directorate at a lot of NASA centers and in companies uh, uh, and uh, in academia uh, around the country. So just wanted to show you some of these examples. <laughs>